meaningless, meaningless as a teacher, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. So says, we believe, Solomon, the author of Ecclesiastes, who by the commentators called Koheleth, which means the teacher, one who, gam who uh, gathers an assembly and teaches them. If so, Solomon was reputed to be the wisest man in the world. Wise men can kind of step back and assess the situation and come up with the true situation at hand. So Solomon, if it indeed be Solomon who writes this, takes a step back, looks at all of life, sees what's happening, and makes his assessment. And his assessment is meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And if that doesn't make your day, I don't know what will. He must have been a cheery fellow to be around. The word for meaningless is sometimes translated by other words, vanity being one of them in the King James Version. It comes from the Greek word hibal, which means vapor. <clears throat> James says, your life is like a vapor that appears for a moment and vanishes away. There's really nothing to it. The counterpart to the word hebo is a Hebrew word for glory, which is something with weight and substance. Because glory is eternal and what we have in this life is passing and temporal. Therefore, it has no real meaning. With this, Solomon puts himself with some of the great minds of our own, not quite contemporary times, but of the 19th century. A man like Immanuel Kant, who wrote the Critique of Pure Reason, a well-known philosopher who said, the grave cast a shadow over all of life, rendering it void and meaningless. In these words from Shakespeare, well known, and from Macbeth, after Macbeth gets the word that the queen is dead, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. In all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out. Out, brief candle, life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. I just love to read that. Brings out the actor in you, doesn't it, huh? Psalm 39 has something very similar to say reminding us of the transitory nature of this existence that we call life. Psalm 39. David says, I will watch my ways and keep my tongue from sin. I will put a muzzle on my mouth as long as the wicked are in my presence. But when I was silent and still, not even saying anything good, my anguish increased. In other words, He's trying to keep from expressing himself. He's not going to say anything. You ever been in that situation? But as he holds it inside, it grows hotter and hotter and more volatile, and pretty soon he has to speak. My heart grew hot within me, and as I meditated, the fire burned, and I spoke with my tongue. Show me, O Lord, my life's end, and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. You have made my days a mere handbreadth, the span of my years as nothing before you. Each man's life is but a breath. That's it. But a breath. We're here for such a short time. What is the sense and the meaning of life? Turning back to Ecclesiastes. He sees the cycles that are taking place on earth. And we might have probably all have asked ourselves this question as we've gone through life at various times. Sometimes the futility of our existence really breaks in on us. 
most of the time we're so involved with putting our nose to the grindstone and going through day-by-day day by day things that we don't have time to consider what we're actually doing and where it's actually leading us, or if it's leading us anywhere. <clears throat> what does man gain from all his labor, which he toils under the sun? <clears throat> Verse 3. <clears throat> generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets. And it hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south, turns to the north, round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. The streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are worrisome more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear is full of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. For there is what? There's nothing new under the sun, folks. I don't think uh, Kohilath would buy into the whole New Year's idea. I mean, what is really New Year's is really not New Year's. The Earth is making its little trip around the sun and turning as it does on its axis. And as it turns, the seasons change. One comes, one goes, another one comes, another one goes, and it's just a cycle. So all that's really happening is the cycle of life is going on. And that's what he sees. He doesn't see it as a new year. He just sees it as another continuing cycle in life. It's really not new. What's new about the year? Just the way of marking time. If we were Chinese, it wouldn't even be a new year. They have another new year. It all depends on how you mark time. Is there anything of which one can say, look, <clears throat> this is something new? Yes. The iPad. It's new, right? Not really. We have all these new technologies, but really, all the laws that govern those technologies have been around since the beginning of time. Did radio waves become invented when somebody invented the radio? or were the radio waves already there. All the laws that govern the technologies that we have have always been there. Man has simply discovered what's been there all along and made an application of it. So even the laws that govern computers, cell phones, radios, televisions, the cathode ray tube discovered back in the 1920s, is simply taking what's already been there and it has always been there since the beginning of creation and making an application of it. So there really is nothing new. The new car that we have, is the steel in the car new? Or is it ored from the depths of the earth? It has been there for hundreds and thousands of years. It looks new to us, but there's really what? Folks, there's nothing new. So what's new? Nothing. Nothing's new. We live in a world that's just, things are just getting recycled, and guess what? We're going to get recycled, too. We're all headed for the scrap heap. I have to tell you something, a little aside. I just bought a... Thank you very much. <laughs> but guess what? It's not really new. It's an 03, but it's new to me. But guess what? It's headed for the scrap heap. It's on its way. Hopefully it will take it a few years to get there, but it's on its way. And guess what? I'm headed for the scrap heap too. And I get become more aware of that every day. I have more aches, more pains. This old body's getting a little dinged up over time. How about yours? You know what I'm talking about? A couple of people are shaking their head yes. We're all headed for the scrap heap, folks. The cycle of life is taking place. We're born, we have children, if fortunate, or maybe not so fortunate, depending on the case. We get old, we die, our children grow up, they have children, they get old, they get either children or get old, they die. Is he's seeing a cycle, a cycle of death and destruction. That's all there is in life. So he said, what's the meaning of life? You work all your life for what? You're going to end up in the grave and then Who's going to take over your, the, all the things you've acquired in life? Somebody will take them over, but they won't appreciate them because they didn't work for them. So what's the point in having them? What's the point in living? Is there any point in living? 
And these very wise men say, really, there's no real point to it at all. It's just meaningless. Isn't this a great sermon? <laughs> so he says, is there anyone of which you... Oh, I read that. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. There was no remembrance of men of old. I look around here, you know, and I think, 150 years ago, somebody was sitting in these pews. We don't know who they were. We don't know their names. I read the names on these windows. Salem Wallace and his wife. Who was Salem Wallace? I have no idea. At least he's got his name up here. We can look at Reverend Charles Percy and think, who is he? We don't know these people. They were very important at the time. Just like we are right now. We're very important right now. But guess what? A hundred years from now, people will not know who we were, and they'll probably look back in the church record and say, Edward Young, who was he? Louise? What's that? That's a funny name. I never saw that. I don't know how to pronounce that name. Who was she? Nobody's going to remember us. We think we're important, but guess what? We're gone. We're out of here. Life is but a walking shadow, Shakespeare says. Meaningless, meaningless. But you know, there's something that, uh, though the, I was going to say as well, as he looks at the cycles of life, he sees that we also get locked into cycles in our own life. We try, we fail, we're going to get a new job, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and we keep on trying and we keep on failing and falling short. And we get involved in cycles of destructive behavior and destructive thinking, just like the world is going on in a destructive pattern of life and death. We're all locked into that. But as I read the book of Ecclesiastes, and I really like the book of Ecclesiastes because it has a little, just a little touch of cynicism to it. You know what I'm saying? And somehow the irony of that kind of feeds something in me. I kind of like that. But you know, there's something that's missing in the book of Ecclesiastes because it's written on this level. Let's step back and look at everything where? I looked at everything where? Under the sun. So everything that's going on in Kohila's mind and his assessment is going on under the sun. That qualifies it in a certain way. Those are things that you can see on a human level, on the horizontal level, under the sun. What about things that are not under the sun? And that's what gives meaning to life, the things that are not under the sun, the things that are not intrinsic to the organic living out of life on the earth. In other words, What's missing in the book of Ecclesiastes is redemption, the redemptive power of God, which tells us, yes, this life can be empty and meaningless at times, but guess what? There's a new life coming, folks. There's a new world coming, and we have something called hope. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 17. I have a new Bible I'm breaking in this morning, and guess what? It's on the way. Yes, that's true. It's on the way to Chucky. Yes, yes. The point I was going to make is it's large print. Uh huh. Which tells you something else about me. Kind of makes my point for me. Pages still stick together. Do not love the world, verse 15, or anything in the world, because why? It's meaningless. It's going to the scrap heap. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does. So we're working for these goals, these things that we want in life, and somewhere along the way we get caught up short and we say, what am I doing? What am I doing with my life? I'm putting all my time and effort toward sustaining and gaining all these things that really don't amount to anything in the end because they're all going to go away. They're all going to turn to dust. And yet the substance of my life is chasing the wind, chasing after these things that really have no substance. You ever come to a place in your life you say, whoa, what am I doing? 
What's it all about, Alfie? You know what I mean? You can do that if you're doing the kind of work I do too. You come over and you see people and you preach and you go back home and you do the same thing week after week. I did it for 24 years and after a while I said, what is going on here, baby? You know, what's it all about? Is this really amounting to anything? Or are we just all caught up in a cycle like everything else? It happens. And that's what he's talking about. Everything in the world, everything under the sun. Everything under the sun. And that's what Ecclesiastes is talking about. And he equates everything that's under the sun or in the world, the cravings of sinful men, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father but from the world. The lust of his eyes. Somebody's watching a young chick on the computer on a pornography site. What if you could see the same little chick 60 years from then? Wouldn't be quite as attractive, would she? But that's what's going to happen. We're all headed that way. Everything's growing old. Everything's going away. Everything's turned into dust. Better go to college and get a degree so you can get all the stuff that's going to turn to dust, all right? Because that's what it's all about. Chasing the wind. The lust of the eyes, the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God, what? Lives forever, folks. Lives forever. There's another dimension. Something that intersects time and space and gives meaning to all that we say and do because it comes not from this world under the sun, but it comes from another place. It comes from the eternal dimension where things are always new because time can't touch them there. In the eternal dimension, everything is always new. Jesus said if we believed in him, we would walk in what? Newness of life. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 31. What I'm basically saying this morning is, without the Lord Jesus Christ and the cross, everything in this world is meaningless. And all the philosophers and all the wise men agree with that. At least the part about it being meaningless. For now on, those who have wives should live as if they had none. That has implications. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the, world, those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them for this world and its present form is passing away. In other words, given what we know about the world and everything under the sun that's passing away, how much do we want to become engrossed in the whole world system? Love not the world, nor neither the things that are in the world. Because something's going to happen. And when we apply the cross of Jesus Christ in the plan of redemption, this picture changes completely. Look at Romans chapter 8. We're starting in verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not, worth, are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation, that is, everything under the sun, the physical world, the planet. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject to frustration, locked in a cycle of death and destruction, not by its own choice, but the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole of creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Something new is going to be birthed. And creation in its frustration and its futility is waiting for that moment when 
creation itself, the physical planet, the physical world, our bodies, which are part of the universe, and part of the planet, and part of the physical world, and everything in it is going to be changed, infused with life and light. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in the pains of childhood right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we waited eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. If you've received the Lord Jesus Christ, then you have this hope that your very body and the planet itself is going to be redeemed someday, and the cycle of death and destruction will be changed. We don't know what it's going to be like, but when we'll see him, we'll be like him, for we'll see him as he is. And there's a great verse over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. It does not just pertain to the hereafter, but the here and now. Verse 16 says, from, So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? The old has gone, the new has come. So there is something new in the world. And you know what it is? It's you. It's us. We're a new creation because we're filled with the life that comes from eternity in which there's no past, present, and future. It's always fresh. It's always new. And that's who we are with the new creation. So Paul says it's not circumcision or uncircumcision that's matters, but a new creation. And finally, Romans chapter, uh, excuse me, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 5. I'm going to start reading in verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more mourning or crying or pain, or for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. New life, folks. New life. You can hear from the rafters. Right? Didn't that sound good? New life. Behold, I make... Everything, what? New. Koheleth, in Ecclesiastes, says there is nothing new and everything is meaningless. And Jesus said, yes, but I'm making everything new, including you. That rhymes. He's making everything new, including you. Infusing us with this life. So let's bow together in prayer. Lord, you are Lord of all, for sure. You gave your life that we would not walk in darkness, but walk in newness of life. That by opening our hearts, by having faith, by believing, we can know that newness of life. We can know you and your fullness. And someday we'll be with you forever in a place with a new heaven and a new earth and a new body that's more wonderful than we can imagine. Every tear will be wiped from our eyes. All pain and suffering and disease will be gone. And we'll be with you forever. That's what it's all about, and that's where we're headed. We, our bodies may be headed for the scrap heap, Lord, but our spirits are headed for eternal glory. And we give you great thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen.